uh, my name is Eric, and I'm a mentor, not all the time, <coughs> in working with young companies, both in Egypt and before in other countries. I've come across most of the things we mentioned earlier, and I'm very glad that the positive elements like passion, family support, came through. I often translate as if you really want it, you can do it. That's something that is not always immediately understood. But what I experienced in Egypt is a new element that I did not see before in Southeast Asia. And I call that ageism. And what I see happening is companies start small and do pretty well at a certain level. But as Endeavor understands so well, scaling up is the name of the game. And that's where you start to hit ceilings. Now, each business, and I'm sure Mushalia has experienced this as well, at some point in time comes to the make or break deal. The one that lifts you from the baby scale into the adult scale. And that is where the people I work with, who are typically in their 20s, do not get past the up. And oddly enough, as a mentor, I do very little in terms of giving business advice, but I pick up the phone and use my personal network, my social network, to get to a chairman, to get to a senior director and say, I have these great kids, give them half an hour. That's my way of doing it, but I'm just one mentor and we don't have enough options. But I would like to ask you if you have more suggestions of breaking that glass ceiling and getting young people to the decision makers who can help to make the real deal. I think that's a great question and I think one, one uh, one answer to that question is uh, I think everybody has a role to play and, and a responsibility to play in developing entrepreneurship in this country. Uh, um, and, and that includes uh, you know, people such as yourself and Ahmed Uzal and a number of people in this room mentoring and sharing experiences with, with entrepreneurs. It includes uh, you know, people like Ahmed and Mohammed coming up with great ideas. It includes people like VJ getting the world to know about those ideas and making sure that people share best practices. But there is also a role for, I think, corporates, uh, uh, you know, and more senior executives in corporates to use their positions to open doors for uh, people starting, you know, younger people and people starting smaller businesses. Yeah. So just as there is, you know, a social responsibility, uh, uh, there is all, you know, such as there, there is corporate social responsibility, people are now starting to coin terms such as corporate entrepreneurial responsibility. And that is a concept I certainly buy into, which is large corporates have a role in supporting the development of the entrepreneurial ecosystem around them and in uh, giving the chance to younger companies, younger entrepreneurs, to, to prove themselves, and that may be one way to to, to address that. I, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything on that. But I think that first, I congratulate you. Uh, <coughs> I think that, like just like Hisham said, <coughs> we wish there were more uh, the people like you. And uh, what the young people need there is that they need role models and the people who can also show them uh, you can do it. There are people who have done that. I think for that, what happens today is that role models are very important. So if you come to our university, uh, the biggest story at my university today is that how a college dropout uh, made computers in his dormitory room and became Michael Dell. So those stories are so ingrained in the culture of the university. Yes, we can do it. And there's nothing wrong in failing. Okay, so I think that, that uh, so those are the role models, and then everybody looks at the ceiling that you mentioned. That once they have have a car and once they have a family, they don't want to grow any further. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But to go beyond that, you have to have the role models, and these people do a great job. Okay, uh, the, the, and people like him in the, 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 in the GCC countries. And these are the people, hey, don't stop here. You should have an exit strategy. And let me tell you how you can list yourself. But you have to work a little bit harder. So from 5 million, go to 10 million. And I can open that door for you. So I commend you for doing that. And I hope there are more people like you uh, that who will create that culture and show this dream to young people. Yes, you can do it. 
but they need role models. That's why I was suggesting that it would be nice to bring those role models here, uh, those models uh, the, the, who have done it, only from this region. You don't want to get them from Europe or America. You want to get them from here or from the other developing countries who have come from very simple back. And I think it can be done. In fact, uh, the, you should get more like-minded people like yourself. Some of them are already sitting here. And uh, why not? Your next session could be just on the same topic. I don't know if I asked your question or not. It was very interesting and uplifting. OK. Yes, we can. Um, this is Ahmed Sadiq, a social as well as a digital entrepreneur, and I would like to ask the Ahmed and Mohammed about the genesis, the inspiration of your project, which you might have answered while I was asleep. And I would like to ask Vijay about the, the genesis of your project in the book. What is it that inspired you to address the Arab world? Why not India Unbound and the Asia Unbound? Thank you. Know the passion of doing things and uh, to start things from a small uh, company to uh, grow into a big company and uh, to, uh, to, to to have your fingerprint and giving standards to people and the, the country now need everyone to to work. That's the thing that gives us the push. And we said we will have to try it and we will make it and we we uh, and. For every challenge we face, we will tell ourselves that we have to face a challenge, we have to go through, we have to, uh, to uh, meet our objectives, and we have to, to uh, take the company from a small company to a bigger one. And uh, so, yeah, things go well. Thank you. DJ. That's a loaded question. <laughs> I wish I had not asked you. But that you have to read the book, I'm going to give you a test on that. <laughs> No, I, I think you have to go back and look at the history of this visa. You have to realize that this, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the whole other world, there were huge traders. Okay, and as a matter of fact, it was an Arab who actually showed, unfortunately, unfortunately, who actually showed the, the Europeans how to find India. So if you go back and look at the whole history of the, the spices and the, uh, the, and so historically. The Arabs are always businessmen, they're always traders. So some who, they need to rediscover themselves and get rid of this mentality that I have to find a job with the government and I have to have a pension. Honest to God. So when you look at my book, you will see that how the, the, the Columbus did not find an Arab trader, so he went to the wrong direction and he called the wrong people Indians. And then Vasco de Cabo, when he came, he had a sense enough to stop in Zanzibar, even became a Muslim for a time period. Then he found an Arab trader who was a little bit unhappy. Okay, he was from Uman in Zanzibar. And he says, oh, you want to buy their spices? And the people hated him. Indians hated him. Because he showed these guys, that I can take you to Goa. You guys were always big traders. You dominated this planet from Asia to, uh, uh, to Europe. Rediscover that. Maybe call next time somebody to give you a history of how great you are, what great traders you are. Maybe look at the history of those people. You know, you'll be surprised. This is in your DNA. You know, on the historical notes, you know that uh, that gentleman, whoever he was, who guided Vasco da Gama, hurt Egypt particularly because the trade used to pass by yeah. by Egypt until the Cape of Good Hope was discovered. Exactly. But, but uh, on that, you know, thank you, thank you for that reminder, DJ, to, to go back to our roots. And, and on that, uh, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, thank you for. Uh, it's it's a real pleasure to have you back here in Egypt. Thank you, uh, you know, for this for this book and for this book being an excuse for us really to have this stimulating discussion about entrepreneurship in Egypt. Thank you to Ahmed Abad for, for sharing his insights and his experience. Thank you to Ahmed al and Mohammed Rahim you know, for coming and inspiring us. And uh, I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. I'll, I'll call the chef here And thanks to, uh, to everyone in this room you know, for uh, braving the traffic and, uh, and, and coming out and being part of this discussion. Again, I think each one of us has a role to play. Uh, we can, it's true, you know, the media doesn't tell the story yet. 
it's true the politics are lousy and these days in particular it's not easy to get things done in Egypt. Yet you know, there are people, you know, young and old, particularly young, with great ideas. There are great mentors. Uh, there are uh, uh, um, great academics and teachers to uh, tell us about best practices and to inspire us. Uh, there are uh, corporates uh, you know, to support that ecosystem that's emerging. Each one of us has a role to play and, and it is through entrepreneurship, job creation, that ultimately this country will be uplifted, uh, not politicians or, uh, or anybody else. And, and on that note, thank you very much and, uh, and all the best. And, and people have you know, kindly volunteered uh, you know, to sign uh, copies of his book, so please grab them while they last. Thank you. And for handshakes, we'll buy it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.